joining us on television. This is just an informal Bible study. We have no denominational handle. And uh, over and over I tell people I'm not under any kind of peer pressure. I'm not under any kind of pressure from sponsors because no one sponsors us. We depend totally on the gifts of God's people. And I think I can safely say that 90% of our contributions are under $100. So we don't have any huge millionaires supporting us. And uh, we like it that way. That way we're not beholden to anyone and uh, the Lord is our only overseer. So join us as we search the scriptures. And uh, again, we do like to always thank you folks for your letters and uh, for your financial help. But most of all, we thank you for your prayers because pray <laughs> does make a difference. And so we appreciate that. I've only got one that I am responsible to and that's the author of this book. And I, I handle it realizing what a tremendous responsibility it is that whatever you are, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're just uh, going to hold a devotion in your women's groups or whatever, never forget that when you handle the Word of God, it's an awesome responsibility. And I never forget that. And that's why we appreciate the prayers and uh, the letters of... Uh, well, what should I say? Encouragement, confirmation many times. Chapter 2, and now verse 15, where Paul, after coming away from his confrontation with Peter, who was still succumbing to the demands of the law-keeping Jews at Jerusalem, now he says in verse 15, we who are Jews by nature, that is, by birth, naturally, and we're not of those pagan Gentiles who, of course, were looked down upon by the Jews of that day. Now verse 16, knowing, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but, and let's put the verb back in, he's justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. Now we're going to go back to Romans where it makes it a lot plainer than this. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Now the reason I want to go back to Romans, in fact let's go back there right now, Romans chapter 3. One earlier Bible scholar that I've read in days gone by put it this way. The little letter to the Galatians is sort of like an artist who had the picture in his mind and he drew it first in pencil. And after he saw the whole thing in pencil, then he put it on canvas with oil. That's the book of Romans. You know, I kind of like that. Galatians is just sort of introductory. It covers all the bases but you don't get the graphic detail, of course, until you get into Romans. Now, here's a good example. This verse 16 in Galatians is kind of hard to sort out. But my, we go back to Romans, here it is. Chapter 3, and let's look at verse 19. Now, this is going to be a review again of what we had several months ago in our study in Romans, years ago, I guess. Now we know, Romans 3, 19. Now we know that what things so ever the law saith, now that's the Ten Commandments that we're referring to, it saith to them who are under the law. In other words, the Ten Commandments were directly given to the nation of Israel, not to the Gentile world, to Israel. But since it's the law of the sovereign creator God, how far does the influence of that law go? to the ends of the earth. And look what the rest of the verse says, that every mouth may be stopped. Even a Gentile can't come up and after having stolen something say, well, I never did anything wrong. Yes, you did, because the law of God says that it's against his will, it's against his law to steal. All right? So every mouth was stopped and all the world, not just Israel, all the world become guilty before God. Therefore, that being the case, by the deeds of the law, in other words, by law-keeping, by works, shall no flesh, Jew or Gentile, 
be justified in his sight. Why? Because the law only has one, what shall I say, function. The law only has one function. And now, you know, we got people all over, even Tulsa and Oklahoma, who think that by keeping the law, keeping the commandments, they're making brownie points, and someday God will just let them, like one fellow told me, oh, he said, if I can just slip in under the door, it's not going to work that way. The law wasn't given for that at all. The law had one function, and what was it? To show mankind how sinful they really are. Every human being has been a lawbreaker and were sinners by nature. And consequently, by keeping the Ten Commandments, no flesh, flesh shall be justified, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. But all right, now let's come on down. Verse 23, for all have sinned, not just Gentiles, like the Jews perhaps thought, but everybody, Jew and Gentile, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And you know, I've put it on this program over and over and over. Not because of anything we have done. That's not what makes us a sinner. We're sinners because of who we are. We're sons of Adam. You know, I've put it on the board many, many times. We sin because we're sinners. We're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. We're offspring of Adam. So all have sinned and come short. All right, now then, but here's the remedy. Verse 24, being justified freely without a cause by his grace, his unmerited favor poured out on us and through the redemption or the buying back process that is in Christ Jesus. All right, come on down to verse 25 and 26. Whom God, Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. Now remember, we looked at the ramifications of the blood in our last program, going all the way back to Genesis 9, Leviticus 17. The blood was something special in God's sight because in the blood is what? Life. See, life is in the blood. All right, and so through faith in the blood of Christ, wherein is, yes, the significance of his death, but far more the potential power for what? Life, eternal life. All right, and so reading on, so we declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God. And then verse 26, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, the righteousness of Christ, that he, Christ, might be just, fair, in every which way. And all of this is wrapped up in the person of Christ in his finished work. <clears throat> and the justifier of him who repents and is baptized. Oh, hey, that's a lot of people think. Read it any which way you want. Oh, to him who does this or does that. To him who keeps the commandment. No, it doesn't say that. It says that he will be the justifier of him who believeth. See? Who believeth. And then he comes into verse 27. So where's boasting? Who can brag? Who can boast? Well, it's excluded. Why? Because the law of faith excludes it. And the law of faith is believe the gospel. I've got my list of salvation verses over there. Honey, put them on the camera because we've put them together for our classes. We've mailed a lot of them out over the years. And these are all just basically salvation verses. And all I want people to realize is not a one of them, not a one of these verses says anything about what we can do except believe, believe, believe. I don't remember the order. Go ahead and put them on the camera if you can, guys. But all these verses, if you can bring it up where our audience can read it, all of these verses say basically the same thing, that when we believe that Christ died and rose from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, it says it in various and different ways, I know. 
but all of these verses that we have on this whole page have been excerpted from Paul's various epistles, and they all make no mention of repentance and baptism. Every one of them make no mention of any kind of works or doing or keeping. They all say basically the same thing, that by grace are you saved through faith and not, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. I don't know if that verse is in there. I can't read them from here, but for our television audience, I hope they can read them. But all I want people to see is that all of these basic salvation verses are just like this one says in Romans 3, that it's through faith in His blood, through His death, burial, and resurrection, and that if we believe it, God does all the rest. We don't have to do anything. He does it. And, and we've been seeing the results of the power of the gospel as, as people have been writing and calling. And I know these are people who have had no exposure to this whatsoever. And yet the Lord is opening their eyes that it isn't what we do, it's what we believe by faith. See? All right, now then coming back to Galatians chapter 2. Going on to verse 17. Galatians 2, now verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, not by the law, but if we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Remember what I said? We're children of Adam. Is therefore Christ the minister of sin? Well, perish the thought. And here's the basic reasoning. Now verse 18. Now this takes a little thinking. I know it does. But think it through. For Paul, remember his past, a religious Jew par excellence, the likes of which no one else could even come close to. But look what he says. For if I build again the things which I destroyed... I make myself a transgressor. Now, what's he saying? Here he has been a law-keeping Jew, and he just killed people because they were accepting something contrary to that. And so he was a religious zealot. But when he suddenly realized that all of that counted for nothing because the work of the cross had now become preeminent, and it's only through faith in the finished work of the cross that sinners can be saved. Now, he says, if I go back and put my converts back under the law and command them to keep circumcision, then I am rebuilding what I have torn down. You get that? Now, let me repeat it. Here he'd been a great practitioner of Judaism. He thought the law and the temple and the Old Testament was the epitome of everything. But once he saw the truth of the power of the gospel of Christ, how that he died, shed his blood, and rose from the dead, then he could literally destroy everything of the old account. And let me show you the verse. Turn to the right a few pages to Colossians. And nobody understood this better than the Apostle Paul. And this is a graphic statement in Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. All with me? Colossians 2, verse 14. Speaking of the work of the cross, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. What was that? The law. And especially the law that was being practiced at the time of Christ which was a compilation of 613 rules and regulations. That's what the law had become, as it was degenerated, of course. But see, all of that, all of the ordinances that was against us and were contrary to us. In other words, the law was absolutely contrary to human nature. Everything in the law, human nature says, do it. See? And so all of these things that were contrary to us, he took it out of the way, and what did he do with it? Nailed it to his cross. 
Now, that's what Paul means then, coming back to Galatians chapter 2, that once he helped uh, believing Jews like himself to see that that old economy had been totally done away with, it was nailed to his cross. Now, Paul says, if I come back and tell these converts that I was wrong and that I got to put them back under the law, he said, then I'm building again that which I have destroyed. Isn't that beautiful? But he said, I can't do that. He could not go back on, on the revelations <clears throat> that the Lord had given him. All right, now let's move on to verse 19. And this is his whole reason for pressing on constantly throughout the Roman Empire with the gospel of the grace of God. For I, through the law, am dead to the law. Now, this is Romans 7 all over again. For I, through the law, am dead to the law to the law, that I may live unto God. Now, let's analyze this a minute. What was the law? Perfect, right? It was the very mind of God. It was perfect from God's point of view. But what was it from man's point of view? It was something he couldn't keep. It was weak. It was beggarly. Because even though it was perfect from God's point of view, from man's standpoint, he couldn't keep it because there was no power in the law to help him keep it. Understand that? The law, as I've said way, way back in Exodus, how did God give it to Moses? On a beautiful piece of lambskin? No, on cold what? Stone. Now listen, stone is not cuddly. I don't care what age we are. Some things are cuddly, but stone is not. It's cold, and it is not something that you can just bring to yourself. That was the law. It was cold. It was beggarly, Paul says. And even Peter admitted that it was a yoke. It was like a millstone around people's throat because of its heavy demand and man's inability to keep it and it had nothing to help him do it. Now, that was the law. And I've always said the law was severe. My, if you went out on the Sabbath day and picked up a few sticks for the fireplace, it wasn't a slap on the wrist. What was it? Death. Death. If someone was caught in an act of immorality, it wasn't a wink of the eye. It was death. That's how severe the law was. All right, we have been set free from all of that because of the work of the cross. But you and I or anyone else that's ever experienced salvation would never realize why we needed salvation if it weren't for the law. See, my own pastor the last few Sundays has been in Romans, and I've really been thoroughly enjoying and I've told him so. And one of the comments he made, you can never be saved until you know that you're lost. I'm quoting him, word for word. You can never be saved until you know that you're lost. How do you know that you're lost? Because the law condemns you, see? If it weren't for the law, anybody could say, well, I'm good enough. God will accept me. But the law says you're guilty. There isn't a one of us in this room that hasn't broken the Ten Commandments. We know that. And if we've broken the Ten Commandments, what are we? We're lawbreakers. And if we're a lawbreaker, we're a what? A sinner. That's all. You know, a lot of people have got the idea that a sinner is just somebody that's down in the gutter. Somebody who has committed murder or somebody who has been in a house of ill repute or any of these things that the world looks of as, as maybe sinful. Hey, listen. Good people are sinners. Nice people are sinners. Church people are sinners because we're all guilty of having broken God's perfect law. And so what condemns us? The law. Come back to Romans 7. Oh, Romans 7 is tough. You know, Romans 7 is like what I always refer to as our eighth grade arithmetic when I was in school. Boy, I'm dating myself, I suppose. But boy, I'll tell you what, those eighth grade arithmetic, do you remember we called them story problems? where they give you a whole paragraph of a, of a background and all of the ramifications, and I'll tell you what, it did blow your mind to try to work them out. 
Well, that's what Romans 7 is. Romans 7, it, it, it just boggles your mind, and then all of a sudden it, it comes out. But look what he says. Oh, beginning in verse 7 of Romans 7. Now, this is a dilemma. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the law something wicked or evil? Well, banish the thought. No, I had not known sin. That is, you remember I always say in Romans, the best explanation of the old sin nature? Paul says, I wouldn't have known about my old sin nature except the law. For I had not known what lust was except the law said, thou shalt not do it. See how simple that is? So it was the law that condemned this religious Jew that he thought was keeping it. Read on. But verse 8, but sin, his old sin nature, taking occasion by the commandments, the law, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. In other words, it got his mind just broiling. For without the law, the old nature was dead. It was inoperative. But it was the law that, that uh, exercised it, see? Verse 10. No, verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, Thou shalt not covet. Old Adam woke up, and old Adam in Saul's makeup said, Hey, that's me. That's me. I'm a coveter. And then what did he do? I died. Well, now what does he mean? Well, he had to die in the realm of that old Adam who was a lawbreaker. And with the death of old Adam, what happens? New life. And that's what we talk about all the time. That's salvation. When our old Adam is put to death because he was a lawbreaker and we become a believer in the finished work of the Christ, which is the gospel, then what? We're a new creation. We're alive. We have eternal life. The whole nine yards. All right. And Paul is constantly referring to that. As Peter said in all his epistles, this is all he talks about. All right, back to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. And uh, now let's move on to verse 20, which is a classic. It's a verse I think that most kids in daily vacation Bible school, at least they used to always memorize, and I hope they still do, where now Paul gives his own personal testimony under inspiration of the Spirit, and it becomes, of course, part of the Word of God. And look what he says. I am what? Crucified. See? Crucified. I am crucified. Now, Paul didn't die on a Roman cross. If he did die a martyr's death, it was, I think, by beheading. He was never crucified. So what's he talking about? Oh, that day on the road to Damascus when the Lord spoke to him and literally knocked him to the ground and the moment Saul of Tarsus recognized that he was dealing with the ascended Jesus of Nazareth, the crucified one, what happened? Old Saul died. He was crucified. Where? In the old Adam. In the old Adam. And immediately what happened? He became a new man, a new creation. And so this is Paul's whole thrust of teaching that now as believers we have these two forces working within us. God reckons old Adam as absolutely dead. But in experience, well, he's still there. You know, I've always told people, I probably shock people once in a while. I don't mind the attacks of Satan half as much as I do the attacks of my old Adam. Now think about that. As you go through a week of life right here and now, where do you run into most of your difficulty? Not satanic as much as old Adam. Old Adam. He's the one that pops these thoughts into our mind. He's the one that catches us in these moments of weakness. And of course, don't take away from Satan's power, not that. But it's our old Adam that just constantly confronts us 
to still go the direction of the old Adamic nature, but opposite it, opposite it, we have that new nature which is energized by the Holy Spirit. All right, now verse 20. Only got a minute left. All right, I am crucified, Paul says, with Christ. In other words, when Christ died, that's when we died. Nevertheless, I live physically. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life, Paul says, that I now live in the flesh, here and now, day by day. How do we live it? By, I think, I hope I'm not doing violence to the text, by the faithfulness. I like to put in there. The Greek probably won't let me do that, but it just helps me personally that the life I now live in the flesh, I live because of the faithfulness of the one who bought me. See? He is faithful. He will never let us down. And then Paul goes on to say, by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, you know, I'm always saying, and how did Peter put it in Acts chapter 2? You killed the Messiah. Paul says, he died for you. Now, that's graphic difference. And this is what we have to understand. So again, look at this verse. The life we now live in the flesh, we live by the faithfulness. Because God is able to keep us, to empower us, to live a life that is pleasing. And we show that he loved us and he gave himself for us. All right, now let's go on to verse 21. So Paul says, with that in view, I do not frustrate the grace of God. Now again, how many people understand the grace of God? Not many. Everybody still has got the idea that God is something up there that is just waiting for some frail human being to goof up so he can zap him. No, that's not God's attitude. God's attitude is one of total love and mercy and grace. Let me take you back to a verse we talked about in one of our classes the other night. Come back to 1 Corinthians and always remember the setting of these various letters of Paul. The Corinthians, as we taught so clearly, I trust, was a carnal church. They had a lot of problems. They were not the epitome of strong believers. They were carnal. They were fleshly. They had a lot of problems. But in spite of all that, look what Paul writes to him in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And oh, let's see. Let's come down to verse 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 6. All right. Even as the testimony of Christ was, what's the next word? Confirmed. Sealed. It's settled. The testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Consequently, so that you come behind in no gift. In other words, they were just as potentially able to accomplish great things as anybody could be, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 8, who also shall confirm you unto the end that you may be what? Blameless. Hey, now that's mind-boggling. Whether you know it or not, that is mind-boggling. That people like these Corinthians with all of their failures and their weaknesses, that if the Lord would have come within the day or two after receiving this letter, would they have stood before God shaking in their boots because of all their failures? No. Paul says if the Lord should come, they would stand before him blameless. And they weren't blameless. We know they weren't. So on what basis could God do that? His grace. See? His grace. I remember we hadn't been on the Tulsa station, but probably a month or two, and a gentleman from here in Oklahoma called. And I, he wasn't angry, but he was a little upset with me that I was more or less alluding to. I hadn't really come out as boldly as I have since, but I was alluding to an eternal security for the true believer. 
And he said, how can you do that? And I said, now look, what part of God made it possible, if you are a believer, what part of God made it possible for you to be saved in the first place? Well, he got my question. He says, his grace. I said, did you deserve it? No. I said, can't you believe that that same grace is going to keep those that are his, even though we don't deserve it? Well, he never agreed with me, but uh, I don't even know that he's still a listener, but whatever. That's what we have to understand. None of us deserve to stay saved, but we do because of his grace, if, of course, we have been truly saved in the first place. And so now, if you're back in Galatians chapter 2, that we stand before him blameless because of the grace of God that unmerited favor. Now, that's not license, you know. I always have to come back and say, God's grace is not license. That doesn't say to the believer, go out and do what you please. No way. But when the believer is under all of the power of the Holy Spirit and he's trying his best in the light of Scripture to walk pleasing in God's sight and he fails, does God kick him out? No, no. The grace of God. You know, years back, I used the, the illustration of anyone who has been a parent. And I imagine most of us have been there. And our little one has just begun to take those first faltering steps. And every parent is proud. In fact, I got one little grandson that just started to walk this last week. And, and we're all just tickled to death. See that little fellow all of a sudden walk clear across the room. All right, but when he falls... Does everybody get upset and give him a boot in his little seat? No. What do we do? Hey, we pick him up, get him on those little wobbly feet and, and get him going. Well, that's what God does. God doesn't expect us never to fall. And when we do, he's right there ready to pick us up and put us on our way. And you see, that's not the concept that most people have of the grace of God, but that's what it is. And so look what Paul says in verse 21. I do not frustrate. I am not going to fly in the face of the grace of God and say, but I have to do this because this is what the law says. Oh, again, I'm going to put it on the board. We haven't used the board for a while, so I imagine it's high time. We today are not... We are not under the law. But where are we? We are under what? Grace. See? Oh, what a difference that makes. We are not under the law. We're under grace. And grace is that attribute of God that is capable of pouring out undeserved favor and mercy on sinners like you and I. Sons of Adam. And all because of the love that was poured out at the cross. That was love epitomized. That was as great an act of love as has ever been done. All because he loved you and I as sinners, see? Not as some kind of an angelic being, but sinners, undeserving. All right? Verse 21 again. I do not frustrate the grace of God for if righteousness come by the law, by legalism, then Christ is dead, what? In vain. Then he was the biggest fool that ever walked to have gone to that kind of a death if indeed it didn't accomplish that for which he went. But he did. He accomplished it. It's finished. And he did not die in vain. Now, as I was just mulling these things over while the rest of you were having coffee, again, I haven't stressed enough in the last couple chapters or program. Are you seeing now that this little book of Galatians is constantly showing the difference between law and grace? and how he is confronting these little congregations up there in Galatia who were being submarined by the Judaizers who said, you can't be saved by grace alone. You have to keep the law. You have to keep circumcision. See? And like I said in one of my first programs today, 
we we think, oh well, th this was something in the past. You know, we're not we're not up against circumcision anymore. No, not circumcision. But you know what? We got a couple dozen other things that are just as insidious. And oh, they creep into the life of believers, and then they begin to doubt, and they begin to wonder. Well, like I said, just like my little grandson, have I believed enough? And just as soon as you begin to doubt, is this enough? Then what does old Satan pop into your mind? Well, maybe I do have to do this. Maybe I do have to do that. And that's the way he works. And so we have to constantly stay in the word that it's true and that it is by grace and faith plus nothing. All right, now as we go into chapter 3, verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. Now, why does Paul use the word foolish? Because they were being hoodwinked into thinking they had to add to his gospel. That's what they've been, that's what they've been doing. That's why he had to hurry up and write this letter. And so he says, you're foolish. Who has, what's the next word? Who's bewitched you? See? Who has been fooling with your thinking? Well, we know who they were. They were Judaizers from Jerusalem. And he says that you should not obey the truth. And what was the truth? Jesus Christ crucified, buried, and risen from the dead. Plus nothing. Plus nothing. And so here they're saying it had to be plus something. Well, that's the way it's always been, you know, except for Abraham. It was always plus something. A lot of people disagree with that. They say that the Old Testament saints were saved by faith. Yes, they were saved by faith, but not faith alone. It was faith plus. And even in Christ's earthly ministry, they weren't saved by just believing that he was the Messiah. They had to repent and be baptized. They still had to keep the law. They were still under temple worship. It was faith plus. But now beginning with Paul's gospel, it's faith plus nothing. I remember years ago, a lady in my McAllister class who was bamboozled by this when she first came in, and she was an artist. And so she made a little plaque for me. And it's an odd-looking little duck, to be sure, but he's got his head cocked, and the question, faith? plus nothing, see? And that's where most people are. Les, are you crazy? Faith plus nothing? Hey, 90% of Christendom doesn't hear that. 90% of Christendom says it's faith plus. But Paul says it's faith plus nothing for salvation. Now, I'm not talking about the Christian experience as we go on down the road. I'm talking about salvation here. It's faith plus nothing. If it isn't, Christ died for nothing. That's what Paul said. Then he's died in vain. All right. So who has bewitched you, verse 1 of chapter 3 again, that you should not obey the truth, that it's the finished work plus nothing, and before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth and crucified among you? All right. Now verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Now watch this. Received ye the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, in other words, the evidence again of their salvation. Did you receive the evidence of salvation by the works of the law? Is that how you got to that place where you are spiritually, by keeping the law? No way. No way. Or did you get to this position by the hearing of faith? Now, come back to Romans. We've got to keep comparing Scripture with Scripture. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, <clears throat> verse 17. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Simple little verse. So then, faith, saving faith, the kind that needs nothing else. So then, faith cometh by works, 
No. By what? Hearing. See? Hearing. Now, there's no work in hearing. There is no work whatsoever in hearing. And that's how faith comes. We contemplate it. We recognize that Christ died, rose from the dead. And that's all I need. And we believe it. And by believing it then, we are listening to the what? The Word of God. Now, I've had it on the board in times gone by. What is faith? Taking God at His Word. See? God said it. We believe it. And God recognizes it. And on the basis of that, He moves in and does everything that needs to be done. Now, that's simplification. I know. And, and a lot of people can't buy it. I can't help that. But the Scripture says that it's by faith and not the works of the law. All right, come back, if you will, again to Galatians chapter 3. Now, verse 3, it's the same thing, only in a little different word. And why? Because repetition, repetition is the mother of learning. And until we hear these things over and over and over, it just doesn't seem to soak in. So here he comes with verse 3, Are you so foolish? Well, same word he used in verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians. And now he comes back and he says, Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, which, of course, generated salvation because of their faith, are you now made perfect or right with God by the flesh? Now, what's the flesh a reference to? Well, the law. The law was fleshly. It was weak. It was beggarly. See? All right. So the spirit of the, uh, received by, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Have you begun in the spirit and now have been made perfect by the flesh? Again, let's come back to Romans. It's been a long time since we've been back there. Romans. Oh, I mean before today. <laughs> Before today. Okay, verse, well, chapter 7 first. Romans chapter 7. Yeah, I know we've been back here before too. But I'm talking about way back. Okay, Romans chapter 7, verse 5 and 6. For when we were in the flesh, in other words, we as yet had no spiritual life, the motions of sins, in other words, the activity of what the law would condemn us for, the motions of sins which were by the law, they did work in our members, that is, the body of flesh. They worked in our members to bring forth fruit unto what? death. See, and that's what the unsaved person is living for. All he's living for is the day when he dies physically and the works of his unsaved experience are going to come up before him at the great white throne judgment someday. And that's the fruit that they're going to have, death. All right? Now verse 6. But, flip side, now we're delivered from the law, which was an administration of death. We are delivered from the law that being dead, wherein we were held, that is the law, that we should, here it comes, that we should serve now as believers, that we should serve in newness of spirit. In other words, this whole thing transformation of life in the realm of the spiritual that we are now in the newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. What's he talking about? The law. See? We're not under that law of the oldness of the letter. We are now in this whole new frame of thinking which is the spiritual realm. And oh my goodness. How do we get there? Believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. And so many people can't see that. All right, back to Galatians chapter 3. Verse 
Verse 3 again. So are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, that is, by Paul's gospel through faith plus nothing, are you now going to move into a deeper spiritual left life by the flesh? And what does the flesh want in the Galatian churches? Legalism. See? Law. Oh, it, it's just part of that old Adamic nature to want to be under some kind of a law. Verse 4. Have you suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? Now, verse 5. He, therefore, that ministereth to you the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, it's capitalized, and worketh miracles among you, whatever it was, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Well, you can answer that question. They couldn't perform any miracles under the working of the law. It was impossible. But, when the Holy Spirit activated the hearts and minds of those pagan Galatians and others throughout the Roman Empire, what was it? It was a miraculous transformation from paganism with all of its excesses, with its idolatry and its immorality. And what they do? They stepped out into a whole new lifestyle. Now, that's a miracle enough in itself. <clears throat> and no doubt... In, in the early church, there were other manifestations of the miraculous. Paul doesn't explicitly delineate them, but the question is still the same. If you have witnessed a miracle, was it through the keeping of the law or was it through the manifestation of the Spirit who was activated, how? By faith. All right, so now then, again, as a... An illustration of faith, which, of course, he uses even back in the book of Romans. He goes back to the Old Testament and picks up Abraham once again. All right, let's look at it now in verse 6. Even as Abraham believed God, and it, his believing God, was accounted to him for righteousness. Now, now contemplate that statement. Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now ask yourself the question, how much else did he do? Well, nothing. He didn't bring sacrifice. He didn't keep a set of commandments. He didn't get baptized in a river Jordan. He didn't do anything but what? Believed God. God. Now, how many times haven't I put it on the board, and I'm going to put it on once again because I go pretty much by the comments from our listeners of what they like and don't like. And uh, we've always put this up here, to believe in God, which 90% at least here in America certainly do. But opposite that, we always have to point out the difference, and that is to believe God. Remember? All right, now, to believe in God is what the multitudes of people around the world, in fact, if it isn't the true God, they're believing in some God. But to believe God, that's what? That's faith, see? Because when we believe God, then we're taking Him at His word, and we are exercising faith. And that's what He's looking for. And so, when Paul again says here in Galatians that... We are to believe God as Abraham did. That sends us back first to Romans. And so come back with me to Romans chapter 4. And then we're going to go all the way back to Genesis and see how all of this has been building. Now, I know I'm always making the, the reference to the fact that the Bible is a progressive revelation. In other words, what was built back there in the Old Testament has not been thrown aside, but it's been built upon and we're going to reconstruct that in the moment, but we're going to go from the top down instead of from the bottom up. Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> Romans chapter 4. Let's just start at verse 1. Now, of course, we took all this almost word for word when we were back in our study of the book, but nevertheless, uh, this is the only way we can compare Scripture with Scripture. 
What shall we say then? Romans 4, verse 1. That Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found. For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath to wear of to glory, but not before God. But what saith the Scripture? See, and that's what counts. It doesn't matter what Paul says. It doesn't matter so much what I say. What matters is, what does God say? And that, of course, is where the Scripture comes in. So look what he says. What saith the Scripture? Abraham believed, not in God, but what? He believed God. Now, what does that tell you? God said something, and Abraham believed it. Now, you know, faith cometh by hearing. We looked at that in the last program. Faith cometh by hearing which says that God has to say something before mankind can believe it. That follows. All right, so here it is. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him or imputed unto him for what? Righteousness. Now this brings a thought to mind. I didn't intend to do this. It just flew into my mind. Maybe I better deal with it as the I trust the Spirit. Come back with me to the book of James, because here again is one of those places where... The scoffer especially, and even a lot of well-meaning Christians, will say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. I, I have problems. Well, come back with the little letter of James and uh, chapter 2. Ames, cha uh, James chapter 2, and drop in at verse 21. And I'm sure you've all been aware of it. Now, Les, how can you say that Abraham and we are saved by faith plus nothing, but James says that if he doesn't see works, then he can't see salvation? Well, let's point it out. James chapter 2, starting at verse 21. Was not Abraham our father? See, now James was a Jew, just like Paul. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? When he had offered Isaac, his son, upon the altar. Now, the first thing I would say, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. When does God deal with the faith of Abraham? At the very beginning or back here when Isaac is already on the scene, which is some 50 years later? Well, at the beginning, see? And so James isn't talking about Abraham's origin He's talking about something that took place 50 years later, which was at the offering of Isaac. All right, let's go on. So he was justified by works when he had offered Isaac upon the altar. Then verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works, and I'm going to put in the pronoun, his faith was made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God and is imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. Yet, James says, ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith alone. Contradiction? Well, on the surface, yeah, it seems that way. But, you see, what is James really looking at? He is looking at the faith of an individual as man determines it. Now, if you and I are to determine whether a person has saving faith or not, what's the only criteria we have for that determination? His works, see? But God doesn't need works. God looks on the heart. And so Abraham was saved by faith plus nothing because he didn't have to show works to anybody. He was dealing with God. And so the next time somebody jumps you and says, well, the Scripture contradicts itself. James says you're fa you're, you can't be saved without works. And Paul says you're saved by faith alone. There's the difference. James is looking at it from man's point of view, absolutely, that if there are no works, then you and I have no idea that a man has saving faith. But God looks at us like he did at Abraham, and he sees our faith without works. I don't have to do any works to prove to God that I have faith. But if I want to prove to my neighbor that I have faith, I better show some works. You see the difference? Plain as day. No controversy, no contradiction. But again, it's just two totally different events. All right, now that's enough for that. Let's come back to Romans chapter 4 for just a moment, and then I want to go back to Genesis. Romans chapter 4 again. So 
What saith the scripture, verse 3? Abraham believed God, and it, his believing, was accounted unto him for righteousness. And then Paul adds, Now to him that worketh the reward is not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And we're not under a debt economy. Oh, maybe we are in politics, but not spiritually. We're not under a debt economy. We will never put God in our debt. And so we can't work for salvation, not one iota. And so then, verse 5 says it all. But to him that worketh, what's the next word? Not. See that? To him that worketh not, but believeth on him who justifies the ungodly. All right, now then I said that since Paul is using Abraham as the epitome of faith. Let's go back and, uh, and check it out a minute again in Genesis chapter 12. Now, I think most of you will remember many of my comments because I do repeat them. I know I do, but I do it for purpose. And that is the most important part of the whole Old Testament is the Abrahamic covenant. It is the very benchmark of everything on which you and I rest by faith and faith alone. All right, now let's look at it in Genesis 12, the Abrahamic covenant. <clears throat> Verse 1, Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said, back in chapter 11, the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And then he makes these promises, these covenant promises, that he would make of Abram a great nation, the nation of Israel, and that he would bless him, that is, materially as well as spiritually. I'll make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and in thee, Abram, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. All right, now we've got to go back a little bit further to pick that benchmark up, and that would be in Genesis chapter 3. Now, like I said, I'm coming from the top down instead of from the bottom up. But here we're coming now all the way from Paul's stipulation that as Abraham believed God, so is where we are. And now then, as faith was that which imputed righteousness unto Abraham, and how that through him all the families of the earth would be blessed. All right, now let's go on further, all the way to Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve have just eaten. They have totally plunged the human race under the curse. And here is a covenant that God makes with Adam. And it's not a very pretty covenant, because in this covenant he is promising all the ramifications of the curse, and how that uh, everything would come under the curse. And then as you go on further in the chapter, that the weeds and the thistles and all the things that are associated with it. But in the very center of this covenant that God makes with Adam is the promise of a Redeemer. Look at it, verse 15, where God says, I will put enmity between thee, that is Satan, to whom he's addressing this, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her her seed. Now you see we pick up the term the seed of the woman from this, who is Christ. All right, so there would be a running battle between Satan and Christ. It, the seed of the woman, would bruise the head of Satan, which of course he did at the cross. But thou shalt bruise his heel, which of course Satan accomplished when he caused the suffering of Christ at Calvary. All right, now, from this place in Genesis 3, that God is going to promise a Redeemer through the woman, on that now we build the Abrahamic covenant that is going to be through this man and through his offspring that the seed of the woman would come. Now, am I making myself clear? Genesis, God promised Adam that the seed of the woman would one day defeat sin and death and Satan. Abraham now is given the promise that this seed of the woman would come through his lineage, through the nation of Israel. 
And so that Abrahamic covenant then becomes the very foundation of everything as we come on up into the New Testament and the appearance of Christ and his earthly ministry, his rejection by Israel. And then we move on into the church age after the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. So you can come back with me now, if you will, to Galatians chapter 3 again. So all of our foundations of faith, not only the how, but also the why, all rests on what God promised Abraham. Maybe before we go to Galatians, I think we've got time. Come back a minute to Romans. We should have stopped there on our way past it. But come back again to Romans chapter 11. And remember the last part of that Abrahamic covenant was that in thee, in Abraham, would all the families of the earth be blessed. And, of course, that comes primarily through Christ, the seed of the woman coming through the seed of Abraham. But it is also a result of what God promised through the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11. And this is an account of how Israel had rejected everything and God is going to literally strip the branches from the tree, which is Israel, that is rooted in Abraham and he's going to graft in the Gentiles. All right, now pick it up in Romans 11 because this all ties together, hopefully. Romans 11, let's drop in at verse 15, if you will. Romans 11, verse 15. All with me? For if the casting away of them, the Jew, the nation of Israel, be the reconciling of the world, which, of course, would be the whole world, Jew and Gentile, what shall the receiving of them, the nation of Israel, be but life from the dead? And, of course, we saw that in our past teachings in Ezekiel 37, how that, that valley of dry bones was shaking. And it finally came together, and finally the flesh came on, and the skin came on. And then finally, at one day in the future now, the nation is going to experience life. Well, what is it but life from the dead? All right, now I've got to move quickly. And so then in verse 16, For if the first root be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root, this is what I want you to look at, if the root is holy, then so are the branches. But... Israel didn't appreciate that position, and so God broke off, verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and uh, thou, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, and partakest of the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Then in verse 7, Paul continues on, on Abraham as his theme. Know you therefore that they who are of faith, in other words, those who have entered into a salvation experience by faith, the same are the children or the sons of Abraham. Now I've got to stop there a while. How many people haven't come up to me and said, well, we've always been told that when we became a Christian, we become a Jew. Well, I said, I don't know who told you, but they're way out in left field. Because a Jew is a Jew by virtue first and foremost of his birth, his genetics, his bloodline, and of course by being an adherent of Judaism and the keeping of the law. But a Gentile is a Gentile is a Gentile. And if you've had salvation, then you are simply a sinner Gentile saved by grace, and you are not a Jew. Well, all right, then they point to this verse. But the Bible says... Well, you've got to realize what the Bible is saying and not take it out of context. What the Bible is really saying here in verse 7, that we who are of the faith way, we have entered in by faith plus nothing, like Abraham did. Consequently, we are spiritually now then connected to this man Abraham. Now, again, we've got to go all the way back to Genesis. I'm sorry. I wasn't planning to do this, but we have to. Come back to Genesis. Last program, we were in chapter 12. Now, I'd like to have you just turn to chapter three, uh, 13. Genesis 13. And there's some interesting words in here. Genesis 13. 
Now, of course, this is the chapter after the covenant, so he's already on covenant ground. He already has all these promises. Genesis 13, verse 16, honey. <laughs> Genesis 13, verse 16. And now look what God says to Abram. You all with me? Genesis 3, verse 16. And God says to Abraham, I will make thy seed, or your offspring. Now, you know, here's another little quirk of, of Hebrew. You have to sort of discern from the context whether the word seed is singular and speaking of Christ, or whether it's plural and speaking of the whole nation of Israel. Now, that takes some doing, I know. And I know when we taught Genesis, I gave the example even in our English uh, language. You can have 12 sheep over there, and you can have one over there. What do you call them? It's sheep, and it's sheep. Well, it's the same way with a Hebrew word that pertains to the word seed. It can be plural, but the same identical word can be singular. So you've got to kind of use your wherewithal to determine from the text, is it speaking singular and the Messiah, or is it speaking plural, the children of Israel? Well, this, of course, is plural. So I will make thy seed, the offspring, as the dust of the earth. Now what's dust? Earthly or heavenly? Well, it's earthly. It's earthly. So his earthly progeny would be as the numbers of the sand of the sea. In other words, the nation of Israel would be, in terminology, of course, that is comparative, compared to the rest of the nations of the ancient world, were by far more in number. All right, now turn the page to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 5. Next chapter, or next page, but chapter 15. And now drop down to verse 5. And now look what God promises. And he brought him forth abroad and said, now God is speaking to Abraham, and he brought him forth and he said, Now look toward heaven and count or tell the stars. If thou be able to number them, so shall thy seed be. Now what was God doing? Playing games? No. God in his infinite sovereign grace was promising Abraham two different groups of people that would be connected to him. Now naturally the dust of the, of the earth was his earthly offspring who came by virtue of the sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now when he brings him out and said, look heavenward, now he's talking about a heavenly connection. And Lord, most of you have been hearing me teach long enough to know that we have two concepts in Scripture, the earthly people Israel and the heavenly people who are the church. All right. Abraham is being promised a connection to both of them. He will have an earthly progeny, which was the children of Israel. He's also going to have a heavenly progeny, which are those who have entered in like he did by faith and faith alone. Am I making sense? I don't know. Sometimes I look at blank faces and I don't know if I'm, I'm getting through or not. Okay, so now he has this twofold promise. The nation of Israel, which would be earthly, but a group out there in the future someplace who would be connected to him only in the realm of the spiritual. Now, I think I've already made my point. As you come back to Galatians, let me put something on the board. Maybe it will help a little bit. Back here is Abraham, way back 2,000 years B.C., 2000 B.C., in round figures. Here stands the finished work of the cross. Here you and I are in this interval from the time of, uh, of the early Acts, and at least I think with the beginning especially of Paul's ministry, and the body of Christ is being called out. All right, now I think I've already made my point. How do we become members uh, of the body of Christ? By faith. Plus what? Nothing. All right, let's put it up here. We become members of the body by faith. Plus nothing. Abraham became the friend of God, became the recipient of all of God's righteousness because of his faith. Plus what? 
Nothing. See? Now, if you were in an algebra class, what would I be able to say? There's an equality, right? This is equal to this. Why? Because we all came in the same way. Now, to make my point, how did people back here from Adam and uh, uh, Abel, and then the one who took Abel, Seth, and then you can come on down to Noah, and all the way up to Abraham, how did they come into a right relationship with God? Faith plus nothing? No. Faith plus what? Sacrifice. See? They couldn't approach God without it. Am I right? Okay. Over here, it's faith plus nothing. But coming up to the cross, even in Christ's earthly ministry, did Jesus ever teach the concept of a salvation by faith and faith alone? No. What were they to do? They were still to be adherents of the law of Moses. They also even had the added responsibility of repentance and baptism plus their faith. Faith alone wouldn't cut it. Even in the early chapters of Acts, it wasn't just faith and faith alone. They had to repent and be baptized. Now, that was a requirement. It wasn't just empty words. It was a requirement. But then along comes the Apostle Paul, and this is why he had so much opposition. And that's why I imagine out there, at least silently, I've got a lot of opposition. I don't hear it, but I know it's out there. Lest you make it too simple. You've got to repent and be baptized. And I've even had people call and say, well, now we've always been told that we have to repent and be baptized and speak in tongues before we can save. Well, that's not faith plus nothing. That's faith plus something. Okay, now what's my point? That just as surely as Abraham here, Abraham was saved by faith plus nothing. Maybe I better tie the two together now. Now here we are, tied together, that by the basis of faith plus nothing, Abraham had imputed righteousness. You and I as members of the body of Christ have imputed righteousness, and that makes us just like Abraham. Does that make sense? See? No one else in all of God's economy had that privilege. Let me show you. You're in Galatians. Turn over to the right to Hebrews. Maybe that'll make my point. Hebrews chapter 11, the great faith chapter. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Y'all got it? Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 4 first. It goes clear back to Genesis chapter 4. By faith, Abel believed God? No. What did he do? He offered. See? He did something. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice. And by it, he obtained witness that he was righteous. Well, by faith primarily, but it was faith plus, see? Now, you come all the way down to verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, and what did he do? Built an ark. He did something. Now, let me ask you, if Noah would have stood out there in the Middle East and said, all right, God, I believe you, a flood is coming, and never built the ark, what would have happened? Hey, he'd have gotten washed away right along with the rest of them. But along with his faith that a flood was coming, what did he do? He built an ark. And all the rest of the way up through Scripture, all those great men of God, Jacob and Isaac and David, yes, they were men of faith, absolutely, but faith alone? No. Faith plus temple worship plus law keeping plus this plus that. Am I making my point? But all right, now Abraham never offered a sacrifice until years later. He did not do anything. He just simply believed God, God saw that man's faith, and he imputed righteousness. 
And so it is with us. Without our doing a thing, we just simply say, yes, Lord, I believe it that you died for me. I believe that you were raised in resurrection power. And I believe it with all my heart. And that's all God's looking for. All right, come back now then again, if you will, to Galatians chapter 3. I could stay in Hebrews 11 another few minutes and prove the same thing, that all those other heroes of faith were also attached with some kind of a human work. All right, Galatians chapter 3. Now verse 8. And the Scripture, the Word of God, the Old Testament, and the Scripture foreseeing, now, you want to remember, God's foreknowledge sees the end from the beginning. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen or the Gentiles through faith, which was preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, In thee shall all the nations be blessed. Now, I know there are some great theologians who stand on the premise that Abraham knew the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And I stand on my hackles and say, no way. No way could Abraham, and there's nothing in Scripture to indicate that he did. There is nothing to indicate that Abraham foresaw the death on a cross and the burial and resurrection of the Messiah. Now, he had an inkling. All the Old Testament prophets had an inkling that God was going to do something. And they also understood from Isaiah, especially onward, that God was going to have salvation for the Gentiles. But they didn't know how. They didn't know in which way. In fact, we may have looked at this previously on a program. I don't think I have, but I may have. Come back with me to Peter. Peter's little epistle. 1 Peter chapter 1 kind of rings a bell that we may have looked at it a few programs back, but it won't hurt to look at it again. First Peter, chapter 1, starting at verse 10. First Peter, chapter 1, verse 10. Of which salvation the prophets, now that's the Old Testament writers, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. Well, if they knew it all, why look and why ask? But they didn't. They didn't know. And so they searched and they inquired and they prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. But verse 11, searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them, that is, in the person of the Holy Spirit, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them who have preached the gospel with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. In other words, did those Old Testament prophets, did they understand this gospel of grace? Well, of course not. God never intended for them to understand it. God had been keeping it secret. In fact, uh, come back to me to Romans chapter 16. And this was our, our theme verse all the while we were sailing the Mediterranean last week, and as we had our, our classes, forenoon and afternoon, we, we, we reveled in that, but uh, the weather wasn't all that commodious, so that wasn't all that glorious, but boy, we reveled in, in the Word in Romans chapter 16. Romans 16, verse 25. Now, if the Old Testament prophets had understood the gospel of grace, and if Abraham would have seen that, yes, Christ would come and die and be raised from the dead and offer salvation to the whole world, then this verse becomes almost spurious. But it isn't. It's the truth, see? All right, you got Romans 16, verse 25? Now to him, Paul writes, that is of power to establish you according to my gospel, 
and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept what? Secret. The Old Testament saints couldn't know it because it was a secret kept in the mind of God. There was no way that he was going to let them understand. The twelve didn't understand. Now, from all the prophetic references in the Old Testament about his death and his resurrection, you would have thought that the twelve would have understood that he was going to die. But did they? No. They had no idea that he was going to go to that Roman cross. And when he hung there, did they expect to see him on Sunday? Well, of course not. They thought it was all over, all done. What did Peter say? I go fishing. Why? Everything was now hopeless. But you see, God kept it secret. He didn't reveal it to people. And of course, I think it's the same way today. A lot of people are kept blind to the truth of the gospel until God opens their eyes. But the minute he opens their eyes, they become intensely responsible because that's his sovereign grace. All right, come back again, if you will, to Galatians chapter 3. So the gospel which was preached unto Abraham was not a gospel that Abraham understood. Oh, he had a concept that God was going to send a redeemer. My land, every Jew, every Jew, even if he has a segment of, of believing left in him today, what is Israel looking for? The redemption, the day of redemption. And what is their day of redemption? When Messiah should come. Now, of course, they got a few of those things mixed up. But nevertheless, this whole concept of, re of re uh, resurrection and Israel coming into a place of redemption, that was certainly on Abraham's mind. But to be able to associate it with a death, burial, and resurrection and the shedding of that atoning blood of Christ, no, they had no concept of that because God didn't expect them to. See that? All right. Now then, verse 9, back in Galatians chapter 3. For or so then they who be of faith are blessed with salvation, of course, are blessed with faithful Abraham. Now, let's put that in a little plainer English. Maybe some of the new translations have already done it. So then they who are of the faith way, that's us. So then those of us who have come into a right relationship, the faith way, plus nothing, are blessed with the man of faith, Abraham. You see that? And so Abraham was the friend of God. You and I as believers are the friends of God. We're no longer enemies. And all because of our faith in what he has said. And of course what he has said concerns that which he had accomplished in the work of the cross. Okay, now let's move on down to Galatians chapter 3. We're going to make a little headway here yet today after all. Verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. My goodness. Do you realize how many millions of people are in that position and they don't know it? They are supposedly law keepers. They are supposedly keeping the commandments and thereby thinking that they're pleasing God they're not pleasing God. They're placing themselves where? Under the curse. Unbelievable. Well, seemingly, except that this is what the book says. Read it again. For as many as are under the works of the law, legalism in whatever form you want to put it, anything that says, well, I'm going to do it my way, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that, that person puts themselves under the curse of God. Now, the word curse here is more than just puncturing a voodoo doll with a needle. This curse is the real thing. This is the curse of the Almighty. In fact, let's go back and look at it. Deuteronomy 27. Deuteronomy 27. 
See, and this is why, you know, our Bible tells us that uh, Christ was under the curse of the law. Deuteronomy 27. And he's coming through all the horrible things that mankind can do, which brings down the wrath of God. But we're not going to look at all of them. Just come down to Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. And this is what Paul is referring to in Galatians. He's warning people, look, when you say that you're going to keep the law in order to merit favor with God, there's no way any mortal man can do it. So where do they put themselves? Under the curse. You got Deuteronomy 27, verse 26? Now I want you to see it with your own eyes. Cursed be he that confirmeth not all the words of this law to do them. And what does that mean? That if you don't keep every last jot and tittle of the law as no man can do and only God could do, you're under the curse of God. Plain and simple. And this is exactly, now flip back to Galatians once again, this is exactly what Paul is making reference to. Oh, it's a warning. It's a tremendous warning. Don't try to put yourself under the law because since you're human, you cannot keep it anyway. But when you put yourself under a so-called legal system, you are actually putting yourself under the curse of God. Now, that's serious business. That's serious language. It's not mine. It's the book, see? All right, verse 10 again in Galatians 3. For as many are on the works of the law under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all the things which are written in the book of the law to what? Do them. Oh, listen, that's what the law commands. Do this and do that. Have I got time? Flip all the way back to Exodus. Exodus 19. Just barely got time. Exodus 19. Exodus 19. Israel has just been led out of Egypt and they're gathered around Mount Sinai and God is preparing to, with Moses and Aaron, bring the nation of Israel under the system of law. And now look how Israel responded in verse 8 of Exodus 19. Verse 8. Exodus 19, and all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord hath spoken, we will what? Do. Do. And Moses returned the words of the people unto the Lord. I wonder what the Lord said. He must have smiled and thought that's what they think. Because you see, people cannot keep the law. And yet, Anytime someone says, well, I'm doing the best I can, I'm keeping the law, they are putting themselves under the curse. 